We're on our way to Isaiah chapter 62. And I'll give you a moment to get your Bibles at the ready and open to the Old Testament, the great prophet Isaiah chapter 62. We're in a great pursuit this morning, and I'm really glad that you are here. Last week, we looked at this idea that Jesus died for you so that he might live in you. The great exchange, his life for yours, in exchange for my death, he'll give me his abundant life, now and forever. And that is the proclamation that Paul makes in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And now, this week, we want to turn our attention to this additional secret of the Christian life. Jesus in you transforms everything about you. And again, this great text, this benediction, this closing text of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. May God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, body, soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now, that perspective, we, we could spend our entire time just looking at and unpacking that particular verse and everything that it says. But I want you to notice the goal of this. God is the one who does this. He is the God of peace, and that's what the gospel brings into our life. The the, the chaos is gone. The, The warfare is gone because I've surrendered. I realize I'm dead. I am defeated. I raised the right flag. And I accept Christ's amazing terms of surrender. And coming under his banner over me, which is love. I I, am given new life because of his blood, because of his sacrifice. And this transformation begins and everything about this transformation is putting faith in Jesus. And as I do that, it's beginning a journey of total transformation in every area of my life. If I brought out the Tupperware from last week, if I brought out those bins, and and we started again with the bin that represents me, and then with the understanding that, that Christ is in me, and then the we could keep putting it in larger and larger containers that would represent, as it were, concentric circles that go out. Christ in me, and it impacts, it sanctifies, it changes my thoughts and my desires and my actions and my relationships and my purpose. To help us in this pursuit today, title of the lesson, A People That Won't Let God Rest. He's the God of peace, but we're going to look at from Isaiah's perspective about being a people that won't give God any peace or rest. And we'll see it in the context. So glad that you're here today. Isaiah 62 I want you to listen to the craving, the, the, the desire in the prophet's voice as he speaks this. And remember, 
The question that we are using to frame all of this is, do we really want more of God? Isaiah chapter 62, beginning at verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you And your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Note verse 6 and 7. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, and they will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Wow. As we look at the hunger and the desire, the craving in the voice of the prophet as he makes this great proclamation, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what is it that has him so consumed and so fired up? What is he so focused on that he cries out like this? Well, we have to understand a little bit the background of the book of Isaiah and Isaiah 62 so that we can make the connection and the application of what a transformed life in Jesus Christ looks like. The prophet Isaiah comes on the scene 700 years before Jesus arrives in the flesh. We oftentimes go to the great book of Isaiah and we look at the proclamations that talk about the coming of the Messiah. 700 years before Jesus is born, there are declarations that are made by the mouth of Isaiah regarding the suffering servant and even the details of how he will be born miraculously into this world. But the context, Isaiah is living in a time where his entire world is teetering on the edge of destruction. Isaiah is writing to God's people. The northern kingdom has already been swept away by the Assyrians. The Babylonians that we were just talking about in regards to Daniel and his companions. Babylon is on the horizon and the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah is about to be swept away. And the perspective that Isaiah has is he knows that God's judgment is imminent. But Isaiah is a prophet. And he is foretelling not only the imminent destruction that is right around the corner. But he looks ahead to another day. And he looks ahead to a new covenant that God will establish with all people of every nation and that they will, in fact, be called the new 
Israel. In fact, hold your finger at Isaiah 62 and go back to Isaiah 2. At the very beginning of this great, lengthy, prophetic message of Isaiah. And let's make sure that we establish this perspective. Chapter 2, verse 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the nations. It will be raised up above the hills and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Stop right there. In the last days. That is in the time of the Messiah. In the last days, this is what God is going to do. And it's going to start and it's going to go out from Jerusalem. And all nations and all people will say, come, let us. This is the, the heart cry of people from all over the world. Coming into a new covenant relationship that God is establishing. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's the perspective. So, Isaiah, in Isaiah 62, is following through with that same theme. And, and notice that Isaiah, speaking for God, declares the Lord himself in these last days is going to give to his people a new name. That name we understand is Christian. It's defined in other terms here, and we're going to get to that good stuff here in just a few minutes. But that's the context that I want us to understand and appreciate. There is a change. A new name is given, and they have gone from desolate and deserted. This is the same idea, the same theme that Peter picks up on that you once... We're not a people, but now you are a people. You were once without mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's the exact same language as Peter is speaking to us as New Testament Christians and spiritual Israel. Well, we want to be the people that are described here. We want to be God's people that cry out day and night. We want to be the people that give God no rest. Now that's an interesting expression. Maybe as a parent, there have been moments when you were about ready to pull your hair out and said, Will you please give me just one minute's peace? You're giving me no rest. I want you to understand that God himself not only is allowing for this, he's asking for it. We could even go so far as to say he's demanding it from his people that we be engaged with him on this kind of level. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about prayer? Absolutely. Are we talking about fasting connected with prayer? Oh, yes. Are we talking about the focus and the center of our heart and our minds? Yes. And that even a thousand times in a day, we turn our attention back to where it needs to be. And so I just want to share with you this morning three reasons that we cry out. Three reasons why we cry out with no rest day and night and we give God no rest. All right. Spiritual Israel, are you ready? Here we go. Number one. We cry out for God's glory to be restored 
through His people. Through His church. Look again at verse 1. I cannot keep silent. Why? For Zion's sake. And again, the Hebrew writer, Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12, he's telling us that we have not come to Mount Zion, Old Covenant, but we have come, I mean, we have not come to Mount Sinai, Old Covenant, but we have come to Mount Zion. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain silent till her righteousness shines out like the dawn. Do you have a holy desire for the glory of God to be seen and to be known? Or let's ask it another way. Are you satisfied with how things are? Are you satisfied with the status quo? Status quo. Blown away. Absolutely blown away. We shared pictures after we came back from being in the Bible lands last year. And at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is where this phrase, this Latin expression status quo, originated. And it's from the standpoint that this piece of real estate and the building, the uh, church, built over the site of the crucifixion and the, the tomb of Christ is owned and is divided uh, among, well, technically six groups. Four primary groups. The Roman Catholics... Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Church, uh, the Syrians, and the Ethiopian Church, they all have a claim. And so they all have areas that are theirs, and they all have areas of responsibility. And so there are certain things that are handled as part of the tradition that has been established now for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But you may remember, we showed some time ago a picture of a ladder leaning on the outside wall up against a window, and that ladder has been there for over 150 years. Because they can't decide whose job it is to take it down. That's status quo. That's where this expression comes from. So let me ask you, are, are you satisfied with the status quo among God's people and in His church? Do you see what we are intended for? Do you see what we could be? Do you see where we are? Do you see where we could be? Oh, if we had time, we, we could. We could have a wonderful journey through the book of Acts and look at the nature of this zeal and this enthusiasm that we see all throughout the book of Acts. It begins on that first Pentecost after the Passover where Christ was sacrificed and resurrected. And now after his ascension, it's been 40 days, a complete 50 days from Passover. And the gospel is proclaimed for the very first time. And men respond. They are cut to their heart. And they proclaim, brothers, what shall we do? Convicted of the fact that they are guilty of having killed the Christ, the Son of God. And the declaration goes forth, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. and you shall receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, Christ in you. He died for you so that He can live in you. And we begin to see the transforming nature of Christ working in His disciples all throughout the book of Acts. 
I love the way that Luke, the historian, even begins the book of Acts. He says, most excellent Theophilus, in my first volume, I told about all the things that Jesus began to teach and to do. This second volume, the book of Acts, we see Jesus continuing. But wait a minute. Jesus is ascended and is at the Father's right hand. That's right. We see him living, breathing. His hands are our hands. His feet, our feet, their feet. We see the pursuit of the disciples chapter after chapter after chapter. Proclaiming the good news, drawing people to him, proclaiming the kingdom, not satisfied with the status quo, sharing the gospel with all nations and people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation coming into the kingdom, this new spiritual Jerusalem. And we see the fulfillment of not only what Christ himself had promised and proclaimed, but what the prophet Isaiah had promised and proclaimed. That the law of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. Proclaiming the new covenant. Do we long for the glory of God to be restored in his church? To be proclaimed in his church? To be multiplied in his church? The glory of God to be increased in his church. Is that what we want? Is that what our hearts cry? Is day and night without rest? That for the sake of Zion, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, until her righteousness shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a blazing torch. If that is your heart's cry. Don't stop. Don't stop. Do we want God like that? Or are we content? God make us this kind of church where we cannot sleep at night for calling out to him for his glory to be revealed. That each one of us, like Moses, we're saying, Lord, I want more. I want to see your glory. Please show me more. We want more of you in this place. Second, we cry out for God's praise to be known among the nations. Verse 1 continues, I will not keep silent. I will not remain silent until her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. Ask yourself the question, why is it that the nations praise God? Well, the text tells us they see something, they hear something. And the picture here, the prophet is praying for the new Jerusalem, the, the spiritual Zion. The prophet is praying for God's people, the church, for the sake of the nations. Isaiah he appreciates. He's being shown. God is revealing to him that all nations are going to flow into this. And so Isaiah is beginning to see and he's beginning to understand and appreciate that God's plan is that all those that by faith in the son that he will send can be descendants of Abraham. By faith. That all nations are being called to come into this new Zion. And we need to cry out day and night for God's glory to be restored in his church in a way that will absolutely astonish the world. That the world will look 
and they will see. Beloved, we've got a plant and we have to water and God will give the increase. Our job, cry out day and night for God's glory to be restored in his church in a way that will astonish the world. We want, don't we? We want Southeast Wisconsin to be astonished with the glory of Christ. And that will happen when God restores his glory in his church. And so we pray, we cry out for the church on behalf of the nations. May it go out from here like a blazing torch. This is why we cry out day and night. When we talked about the fiery furnace this morning, we, we, we were talking about fire and the incredible power of fire. It's interesting to me that that's one of the images that God himself uses to describe not only his word going forth, but the passion of his word, the zeal of his word going forth from and through and by his people. It's a blazing torch. And this is why we cry out day and night. All right, and here's the third reason we cry out. We cry out for God's son to return for his people. Now this is where it starts to get really good. Look again starting in verse 4. No longer will they call you deserted. Isaiah speaking as it were directly to us from 700 years on the other side of the cross. He says, no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. Now, if you've got a good study Bible, if you've got a good translation, note your footnotes and you're given the meanings of both of those names. They are transliterated out of the original Hebrew directly to us. Hephzibah means my delight, or she is my delight. And Beulah means married. Again, it picks up on this theme from Peter of, you once were not a people, but now you are. And that harkens all the way back to Hosea, who's a contemporary of Isaiah. You once had no mercy, but now you have received mercy. You once were desolate, but now you are a delight to the Lord. You once were barren and desolate, but now you are married to the Lord. This incredible this incredible perspective. And then verse 5 builds on this marriage theme and it speaks of a bridegroom. Now, NIV says a young man. The, the term bridegroom is so significant because, of course, from a New Testament perspective, we come to the Gospels. We come to the epistles. Who is the bridegroom? Christ himself is. Christ speaks of himself as the bridegroom. Uh, in, in the Gospels, in, in Matthew chapter 5, he ties all of this in. He is the ultimate bridegroom. But not only that, I want you to notice in verse 6, there's another group that's identified, and they're called watchmen. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah is writing shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem. Soon there will be no walls, and soon there will be no watchmen. 
And then as the captivities, uh, captives are taken away into Babylonian captivity for the 70 years that is prescribed by God, when they return back, it isn't until Nehemiah comes along that the physical wall around Jerusalem is ever rebuilt. In the context of spiritual Israel, of spiritual Zion, watchmen, there is a sense in which every single one of us are called upon to be watchmen. The word watchman is sometimes translated overseer because that's literally what they were. They were high up on the wall. They are watchmen. They are overseeing. And they're overseeing two different things. On the one side, you look down into the city. But looking the other direction, you're looking outside on the horizon. And watchmen typically are looking for who? The enemy, right? And they sound the alarm. But there's a totally different picture that's given here. Here the watchmen are looking. Not for the enemy. They're looking for the bridegroom. They're looking for the bridegroom to come. And to announce and to proclaim. Hey! <laughs> he is on his way! What we've been waiting for. What we've been li living for. He's on his way. And of course, the glory of this is that the bridegroom is not only just a bridegroom. He is the king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He's the bridegroom. And he's coming. And I'm telling you. From Wednesday night on when Brother Witt was talking about you can make a difference and despising the day of small things and God says how dare you and looking at the power of his word that his word is like a hammer and his word is like fire and, and as all of these thoughts for today were congealing and, and still sort of you know on my knees in regards to what it means to live that I am crucified with Christ. And coming to the realization that I'm called upon to be a watchman. And what's my job? My job is to be crying out for God's Son to return for His people. And I'm telling you, When you are just overwhelmed by despair, disgust, with the manipulation of the media and everything that our culture is dealing with and, and the way that our society is literally biting and devouring one another. Tell you what, there is a conviction here that our time better spent than praying for all of these things our time would be better spent crying out, Lord Jesus, come. We are the watchmen on the walls, and we cry out day and night, longing for the bridegroom's return. No matter how dark, how hard, how difficult, look up, over the dark horizon, our King comes. We, we started this morning with this great 
benediction of the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians. The, the first Thessalonian le letter is all about Christ coming again. In fact, hold your finger at Isaiah 62, and if you want to go over to 1 Thessalonians, I want you to notice the last verse of every chapter in the book. Now, we know that the, the chapters were added later, but sometimes chapter divisions come at good places, sometimes they come at bad places. Very significant here. Look at the last verse of each chapter. Let's start with uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Come over to the last verse of chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Look at the conclusion of chapter 3, verse 12. May the Lord make your heart increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you, verse 13. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy saints. Look at the conclusion of chapter 4, verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And then all of chapter 5 is about his coming. And we looked at the great benediction that focuses, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 23. That's the perspective. The final cry of the book of Revelation is, Come, Lord Jesus. And this is why we pray. This is why we fast. This is why we cry out day and night. And we don't rest. And we don't give Him rest. We want him to come like this. We want Him to come for us. Why don't we cry out like this? I think it's because we have become comfortable with the absence of the King. Even in spite of everything going on, we still have some pretty comfortable lives. We have nice homes. We have nice cars. To the point that we are okay that Christ is not coming quickly. We cry out because nothing compares to our Christ. So family of God at Spring Street. Let's be a people that won't let our God rest. Let's call out to him day and night. Let's not give God rest from our praising. God, we will exalt your name. We will praise you. We will praise you in the midst of the storm. We will praise you from out of the fiery furnace. And you will deliver us one way or the other, either by it or through it. But we will praise you. And we will not give God rest from our confessing. God, we will reflect your holiness. We want to be like you and like your son. And we want the transforming work of your son in us to make us and take us from one level of glory to the next and the next. We want to be more and more like your son. And we will not give God rest from our praying. Luke chapter 18. 
verses 1 through 8 there, the Lord, and He's talking about prayer. And He ends with that rhetorical question. And you just know that all of the disciples are absolutely stunned and silent. And nobody dares say a word. When Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith on the earth? We want to be His people that are crying out to Him day and night. God, we will boldly come before Your throne. And God, we will never give up. And let's not give God rest from our working. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. That's an amazing statement made by our Christ. And so, on the one hand, do you get it? Do you get it? We're crying out day and night. We want the bridegroom to come. We're looking for him. But what do we have to be doing at the exact same time? we got to be proclaiming the message. Because he's not going to come until it's gone forth. God, we will, by your grace and by your strength, we will accomplish the very purpose and reason for why you have saved us and given us your mission. Well, do we really want God? Or are we satisfied? Are we content with the status quo? Or will we, as God's people, those who rose up and said, come, let us, the, the willing that have come to Mount Zion for salvation, will we say we want more? More of your glory, more of your majesty, more of your power. And you will find us on our faces crying out to you. Now, And if the Lord delays, six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now, whenever there's a vaccine and coronavirus that goes away, we'll still be on our face crying out, come Lord Jesus. And if God gives us days, however many days they are, will still be a watchman. Let's pray. God, your word, it is a blazing torch. It is a fire and it is a hammer. We are so thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ and we are so amazed and astounded and joyful that we have been united with Christ by baptism, by your plan, by your grace, by the power of the blood of Christ. You have accomplished it. And Lord, you are the one who is faithful. You are the one who has called us and you will do it. Lord, we want to be your people. We want to be sanctified by you through and through our whole body and spirit and soul to be kept ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know there are those here today who have never named Christ, have never received by Christ's blood and through your grace, this new name. And we pray for them. We pray that even today that they would come to know Christ as Savior. 
And so that they, along with us, joyfully can be anticipating the return of the bridegroom, ready for his bride. Lord, give us strength. I, and <laughs> we recognize that what we're asking for, we, you've said you want us to be worn out, that we would have no rest as we cry out to you, that we would be so engaged. But Lord, we know in our own strength, we cannot do it. But by and through your strength, we will mount up on wings like eagles. Lord, we give you what is your own. We give you ourselves. Thankfully, we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to stand together and we are going to sing this song of conviction. We've been singing it a lot lately. But I tell you, it speaks to everything that we have considered from God's word today. Let it, let it strengthen. Let it become arte in our spine. We want more.